In 1999, when Sony unveiled the PlayStation 2, it was capable of loading almost every single PlayStation 1 game and even supported its memory cards and controllers. The PS2 would be backward compatible with PS1, and the term backward compatible has become very popular in recent times. Microsoft is promising the commitment to bring your games with you to a new generation, while Sony is offering a 99% compatibility path to bring existing PlayStation 4 games over to the PS5. The Sony PlayStation 2, however, would not be the first console that was backward compatible. Systems like the Sega Genesis would allow for adapters to play Sega Master Systems games. Going back even further, the Atari 7800 runs almost every Atari 2600 cartridge, this was officially the first console to ever support the feature. But going back to the PlayStation 2, while not the first, it was clear that Sony always had PS1 backward compatibility in mind. It was definitely not an afterthought. The I.O. processor of the PS2 known as I.O.P. initially ran the MIPS R3000 chip, which is the exact same processor that powers the PlayStation 1. In later model PS2s, the I.O.P. chip was replaced with a PowerPC chip instead, and the R3000 CPU core would be emulated in software. This explains why there are some PS1 games that won't run correctly on later model PS2s or others that have general compatibility issues. One of the unique hardware features of the PlayStation 2 is its two vector processing units, VPU0 and VPU1. VPU0 is used for geometry transformations and polygon manipulation. When the PS2 is set to PS1 mode, VP-00 houses an implementation of the original PlayStation 1 GTE or Geometry Transformation Engine. Sony architected the PlayStation 2 to be a true evolution from the PlayStation 1, but it had ensured that PS1 features were implemented in its hardware specifically for backward compatibility. Interestingly enough, the only implementation that was emulated in software would be the PlayStation GPU processing that was handled by the Emotion Engine. The PlayStation 2 architecture consisted of three key pieces, the CPU or the Emotion Engine as we just discussed, the GPU known as the GS or Graphic Synthesizer, and the 32 megabytes of dual-channel RD RAM. The PlayStation 2 would go on to be the best-selling console of all time to date. And this fact was not overlooked by Sony, who wanted to bring the PlayStation 2 forward to its next generation. And in 2005, when Sony unveiled the PlayStation 3 at E3, it was announced that the PS3 would be compatible with both PlayStation and PlayStation 2 games. Early models of the PS3 would contain hardware chips from the PS2, including the Emotion Engine, the GSU, and the RAM bus, these chips were directly soldered onto the motherboard, effectively replicating the PS2 hardware on the PS3. However, this was not the entire story as emulation was also utilized. Other important parts of the PS2, such as the I.O. processing and sound processing, were not hardware based at all, with both of these features offloaded to the cell's SPUs. Because key pieces of the emulation was hardware based, PS2 backward compatibility on the original PS3 hardware would be quite high, and the best compatibility all round. The CECHA or B models are still very sought after for this reason, assuming you can find one without a red ring of death. In 2006, Sony released firmware 3.0 on its popular handheld, the PSP. This firmware revision would add Sony PlayStation 1 backward compatibility and would emulate the hardware very well. Once again, the hardware of the PSP was a good match to emulate the PS1. This was simply because the PSP's MIPS R4000 would be a good match for the R3000 found in the PS1, and it was said to be emulated natively, which would account for its high performance. It would also utilize the overclocking feature of the PSP to dynamically change the speed based on load. Adding new features, such as PS1 backward compatibility to the PSP, was an incentive for users to upgrade firmware. It was done to patch security holes that would cripple the PSP hardware for years. This was an ongoing cat and mouse game between Sony and the hackers. Upgrading to a newer firmware would allow you to play the latest games and access the PS1's catalog at the cost of removing the exploit that would allow you to play illegal ROMs or homebrew. But hackers would find new exploits and Sony would be forced to make new firmware revisions. During this time, however, Sony was committed to its back catalogue of games, but that would soon change. 
the high cost of manufacturing the PlayStation 3 with PlayStation 2 hardware meant that Sony was losing money on each and every hardware unit sold, and to save on cost they revised the PS3 to remove the Emotion Engine and RAM bus memory, but to retain the GS chip. The Emotion Engine would soon be emulated in software, and this would become the second PS2 emulator that was used on the PS3, this was known as PS2 GXMU. The Emotion Engine would be handled by the PS3's PPU, while all SPUs would perform PS2 tasks. Backward compatibility would be stripped further during the release of the PlayStation 3 Slim. Removing the GS hardware would further reduce costs, and Sony at this point was losing the battle with Microsoft and the Xbox 360. Sony's market research determined that PS2 backward compatibility was a niche feature, and in reality, most people would never use it. By 2007, it was completely removed with a firm focus on looking forward. If you wanted PS2 on PS3, you would need an early FAT model. But five years would pass, and perhaps encouraged by the backward compatibility library Microsoft had on the Xbox 360, which would support roughly half of the North American original Xbox titles, in 2012, Sony would restore PS2 support for the PS3 and offer more than 70 titles on the PlayStation Store known as PS2 Classics. This was a fully software emulated version of PlayStation 2 and everything was managed by the SPUs and once again, the Emotion Engine emulation would be handled by the PPU. While the software based emulation was of a lower compatibility, the emulator worked well enough and in some cases offered better performance over original hardware. The signs pointed to Sony investing once again into its back catalogue. The Sony PS Vita, the successor to the PSP, would also contain built-in PSP emulation, which had a very high level of compatibility. Sony would sell PSP games for the Vita on its PlayStation Store. In 2013, when the PlayStation 4 was released, it would come with zero backward compatibility. Some consumers were confused as to why it would not support PS3 games. We've covered the complexities of the cell process in great detail on the channel, but the takeaway is, Sony would ultimately look to remastering games for the PS4 instead of attempting to emulate them due to the complexity of the PS3 hardware. In 2015, after months of rumors and speculation, as well as stealth dropping a PlayStation 2 emulator in a Star Wars bundle that released with four games, by November, Sony would officially confirm PlayStation 2 games on the PS4. Unfortunately, however, this was not as simple as inserting a PS2 disc in the PS4 and playing it. Rather, it would be a curated list of games that were repackaged and sold on the PlayStation Store. This was a disappointment to many. While technically still using emulation, it was a bitter pill to swallow if you already owned these titles. There was, however, some technical reasons for this. Each PlayStation 4 title must support trophies, and this includes the PS2 classics. Essentially, they were packaged up games that came bundled with the PS2 emulator, a copy of the ROM, and the specific code for the game that included trophy support and other game-specific patches. Adding trophy support to emulated games is a very complex and time-consuming process. Without original source code, it becomes very, very difficult. In 2017, PlayStation CEO Jim Ryan suggested that they were no longer interested in supporting its back catalogue by saying, when we've dabbled with backwards compatibility, I can say it's one of those features that's much requested, but not actually used much. Still, Sony has announced that the PS5 would be backward compatible with 99% of PS4 games, and will read PS4 discs. A system that has sold over 100 million units, this makes sense for both developers and consumers. There is, however, no commitment at this time to support PS1, PS2 and PS3 games. The hardware is certainly capable, and with modern rendering techniques, AI upscaling and reconstruction, could mean that many of these older titles could look great on newer hardware. Now, Sony clearly have their hands full with the launch of the PlayStation 5 and ensuring their launch window is smooth and making sure that their games are launched and everything runs according to plan for the first 12 months, I think is their big focus right now. But I do expect to see PlayStation 1 and PlayStation 2 backward compatibility eventually hit the PlayStation 5. Now, whether it is the PlayStation Store model that we've seen in the past or some other form of emulation does remain to be seen. 
But I want to hear your thoughts in the comments below. What do you think about Sony and their history with backward compatibility over the years, going from the first PlayStation all the way up to the PlayStation 5? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And as always, if you like this video, leave me a thumbs up and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye for now.